Good evening and welcome, or welcome back. Tonight we are happy to introduce Sharon Aker, an independent art historian who has become a leading international authority on Medardo Rosso and a very important scholar of Luciano Fabro and Lucio Fontana. Sharon Aker took uh, an MA in History of Art at the University of California, Berkeley, where she received in 1999 also the PhD in History of Art. She also collaborated with many important institutions, such as Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice, Galleria Christian Stein, and Archivio Luciano Fabro in Milan, where she lives. Among her publications, we can remember Icarus Fell Here, Medardo Rosso in 2009, and with Ari Cooper, the exhibition catalog Medardo Rosso's Second Impression in 2003. She also contributed to the Kunsthistorisches Institut in Florence's project on uh, sculpture and squares with Issei, Markets, Bacchanals and Gallows, Luciano Fabro's Italia Lasta in Piazza Plebiscito in Naples, appeared in the volume Sculpture und Platz, edited by Alessandro Nova and Stephanie Anke in uh, 2014. Her articles appeared on prestigious journals such as Forum Italicum and the Burlington Magazine. But Sharon Aker is also a prolific lecturer. She held conferences in American and European universities and participated to prominent meetings. Tonight, she's going to suggest a wider glance on Italian sculpture of the late 19th century in the context of Italian unification. So the title of our conference is Monuments Without Idols, Glimpses of Modernity in Late 19th Century Italian Sculpture. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ecker. Good evening, and thank you so much. What a nice introduction, and such a beautiful place, and really nice to have such a, an audience for 19th century sculpture, which, as we were saying, is never considered very sexy. So tonight, we're going to hope to make it a little more sexy. Uh, but since there are not a lot of us, maybe if you want to ask questions at the end or discuss anything, um, I'm happy to answer more questions. This is a piece of my upcoming book on Medardo Rosso and um, late 19th century internationalist sculptors, sculptors who sculpted abroad outside of their own country. Um, so this is a test case, and I'm happy to have feedback as well on what you think of it. In the center of every important piazza in almost every Italian city, you will have noticed that there is a monument to Giuseppe Garibaldi. They are over 400 monuments in all, and they've been well studied by art historians. These are the monuments that make up our daily lives in Italy, those that history has consigned to us, and those that will remain standing for future generations. But these 400 created monuments multiply enormously when we consider that for each monument, there was a competition in which a large number of projects were refused. These failed projects um, have been forgotten, and we don't have their history anymore. We don't even have their images anymore. Why should we care about monuments that never came to full fruition? What can they tell us about modern sculpture and the construction of national and patriotic identity in post-unification Italy? In order to illustrate the power and the potential of such refused works, we need a better understanding of the historical moment in which these works were made. So today, I'm going to describe to you the Italy of the 1880s, which is a period people don't like to address because it's a little bit chaotic, uh, two decades after unification, a period that was characterized by uncertain nationalism and ambivalent internationalism. I'm going to suggest that the generation that grew up in the aftermath of the Risorgimento was one that was filled with hopes as well as disillusionments. The death of Risorgimento hero Giuseppe Garibaldi in 1882 intensified feelings of anxiety about Italy's future, which were compensated by an unusually large number of highly conventional monuments to the hero erected throughout Italy. Only one young sculptor, Medardo Rosso, saw through the hollow official rhetoric by rejecting the tradition of heroic myth-making in sculpture. So what I want to do in this talk is to shed light on unexplored aspects of Rosso's early political experience and his two revolutionary monument proposals for Giuseppe Garibaldi, both immediately rejected, in which the artist dared to criticize what he saw as falsely reassuring nation-building myths. I'll show you how Rosso adopted a modern artistic language of protest to experiment with new forms of expression that rejected the heroic idioms of traditional sculpture. Finally, I'll suggest why his intuitions are so important for today's anti-heroic conception of the monument. This is more what Rosso is known for. If, how many of you guys know who Medardo Rosso is? 
okay, nobody. He is a, uh, he's known as Italy's most revolutionary late 19th century sculptor, and these works are what he's known for, very far from the monuments to Garibaldi. Writings and exhibitions link his early experiments, which you can see up at the top there, the, the portinaia, the, the concierge um, in wax, um, to these kind of experiments with rough surfaces that became highly uh, receptive to light. And that was associated with the Milanese scapigliatura movement, which is a painterly movement of the 19th century in the Lombard area. Um, Later forward-thinking ideas and experiments with sculpture, drawing, and photography, you can see these are two of his photographs of his sculptures, these spooky-looking photographs, were made in Paris in a, after he moved there in 1889, and these have linked him more closely to major 20th century sculptures such as Brancusi and Giacometti. I hope you'll learn more about Rosso next year because we're going to have a big exhibition at the Pulitzer Foundation. It's the first one since the 1960s of Rosso's sculptures, drawings, and photographs. Um, so. Hopefully, he'll be reintroduced to American audiences. What scholars have never noticed is that Rosso grew up in the aftermath of the Risorgimento. No scholarly attention appears to have been given to the important influence of this Italian historical context upon Rosso's early years in relation to his later formation as a contentious revolutionary avant-garde artist. Although Rosso was too young to have participated in the Risorgimento, he grew up in its aftermath. and. Um, here is a little cartoon of Garibaldi and Cavour as cobblers um, fashioning the Italian boot. The decades that followed Italian unification in 1861 were a fragile period as Italy struggled to define a new national identity after centuries of regional divisions and domination by foreign forces. Unfortunately, the long-awaited unification gave way to chaos and disorientation. As we shall see, like many Italians of his generation, Rosso was very dissatisfied by the unfulfilled promises of national unity, and he would ex seek to express this dissatisfaction in his early art. Uh, one of the biggest problems with writing about Rosso's early years is that all the biographies that exist provide very slim, unsubstantial, or erroneous information about him. So I have spent about 20 years reconstructing his life in municipal archives. Records that were previously unconsulted confirm his birth in Turin on June 21st, 1858, on the eve of unification. In 1861, when little Rosso was three years old, Italy achieved unification. Turin became the new birthplace of the Kingdom of Italy, the Regno d'Italia, and Parliament crowned Vittorio Emanuele II as the first king of Italy. Throughout the 1860s, Turin would be Italy's first capital, and so it and Piedmont, the very places of Rosso's childhood, we, would become the springboard for the political events that shaped the entire country's new national identity. Uh, Rosso has a very specific role in this period. He's among the so-called nati troppo tardi, which are called the born too late generation. And that term was a term taken by a historian named Roberto Balzani from a novel called The Little Diary of Giamburasca, Il Giornalino di Giamburasca, by a man whose pseudonym was Vamba. This term referred to the first generation to grow up after unification that had not lived through the Risorgimento and thus had no memory of the heroes who had fought to unify the country. As Rosso's generation reached adulthood, it became disoriented, for it could not draw direct inspiration from the heroic labors of the preceding one in its struggle to form a national identity. Rosso's knowledge of his country's past would therefore be constructed and filtered through later interpretations of ideas about national unity. It is this lack of direct experience that would influence his artistic outlook as an adult. And I added this painting because it's made after unification, 1862, and you can see these little children who have no lived memory of the Risorgimento. So they have to imagine it playing with soldiers. They have the Italian flag, the little costume that was left by somebody, and of course the um, image of Garibaldi tacked up onto the wall. It is all an imaginary process for these little children. Scholars have not considered the influence upon Rosso's artistic viewpoint of the new Italian educational model that was constructing myths of national unity as well. To increase literacy, elementary schools offered free primary education, as well as socialization into a specific sense of national identity. By 1861, Italian became the official language of schools throughout Italy. Rosso's generation was inducted into the mythology of the Risorgimento through a vast range of books and images. Public monuments and new nationalistic rituals and celebrations contributed to this mythology. And you could see, even in this classroom, the map of Italy in the back, the unified Italy, right? How important that was for children to be picking up on. 
Rosa's early pedagogical model was one that would inspire Edmondo de Amici's popular 1886 novel, Cuore, Heart, set in Turin, again, and written in the form of a little boy's personal diary. The book reflects the values and principles by which the new generation was becoming educated, providing a glimpse into the emotional universe of children like Rosso in the post-Risorgimento decades. And what I'm going to show you as I speak now is just a few images from the book so you can kind of get an idea of the generational gap um, that, that was going on at that point. You can see young boys, a uh, little bit older men, and then much older men in this kind of tense relationship. Let us fast forward. Um, Okay, so here, sorry, there's a little bit here. Um, as historian Gilles Pecou has noted, from this work, a generation of Italian children had, quote, gleaned the love of the fatherland, learning all of the nation's new values, friendship, piety, honesty, passion for one's work, love for one's family that naturally translated into love for the home country, which had as its focus the veneration of United Italy's founding fathers. Rosso's earliest projects for national monuments would constitute a rejection of all of these myths and the rituals connected with them. So here I can't get into too much more about his early education, which is really fascinating. We're going to have to fast forward to when he's a young adult. And he is now 20 years later, and he moves to Milan. Milan at this time was the center of the most intellectual and cultural advances being made in Italy. Therefore, although no information has emerged about Rosa's life in the period, there is reason to believe that his experience during his first year and a half in Milan would have led him to choose Milan as the future site of his beginnings as an artist. However, on November 15, 1878, at the age of 20, his life there was interrupted when he was ordered to register for compulsory military service, another new form of national identity formation. Rosso's later negative recollections of the Italian army, expressed in interviews, suggest that the experience led him to question what he perceived as Italy's further attempt to impose a false sense of patriotism upon its citizens. Rosso's transition to adulthood occurred during the chaos that characterized Italy throughout the 1870s and 1880s. Political parties became ever more fractured as old and young members could not reach agreement on the direction in which the country should go. The extreme left party, founded in 1887 by Felice Cavallotti and Agostino Bertani, stood for radical and popular democracy. On the other hand, the Partito Operaio Italiano, the Italian Workers' Party, founded in 1882 by Constantino Lazzari and Giuseppe Croce, advocated social justice and promoted collaboration among national associations and groups of workers. What's interesting about all this is that where all these groups agreed was in their opposition to the government. Interestingly, the leaders of both groups claimed to be the heirs to Garibaldi, as did politicians like Francesco Crispi, who cited his link to the Garibaldian tradition as a means of support for the government. Despite being stationed in the um, nearby Lombard town of Pavia, Rosso would have certainly remained in contact with the cultural ferment of Milan, which was the country's new moral capital and Italy's most modern city. And here you can see the very first omnibus uh, coursing through Milan. That was a, quite a novelty for the time. In spite of the national crisis, the citizens of the Lombard capital generally expressed unprecedented optimism and faith in economic and industrial progress. Here's the very first telephone. And uh, you can see the phone lines being put in Milan right in that period in the early 1880s. There's the first phone call being made. Indeed, even in times of political chaos, the industrial economy of Milan would be the source of its cultural regeneration throughout the 20th century. Here is the first experiment with electric light thanks to which we have iPhones today, um, where they're trying out in Piazza Duomo electric light, moving from gas light to electricity, which must have been very blinding for people. In the early part of the century, Milan would become the birthplace of futurism. This you all must know. The movement that glorified speed, progress, and machines. And I chose the image of the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele, um, the, the fight in the gallery, because the electric light is streaming through, this blinding electric light. So that was considered a sign of modernity. Milan's progress, however, could not obliterate Italy's unstable political situation. Torn between an economically advanced north and a very backwards, underdeveloped agricultural south, the country remained linguistically and culturally fragmented. There was further division between the nostalgic revolutionaries and the anti-revolutionaries, the patriots and the anti-patriots, the nationalists and the internationalists, the pacifists and the anarchists. 
Combined with social unrest in Milan that reflected the human cost of modernization, this political ferment would be, uh, would be the cause of nationalist and imperialist doctrines that ultimately drew Italy into World War I. Again, now we have to fast forward to Rosa's return to Milan after military service, beyond his first exhibition at a little satirical show in Milan, followed by a brief enrollment at the Brera Art Academy, from which he was very soon expelled. He was quite rebellious. He, he actually was expelled for punching a fellow student who wouldn't sign a petition to have um, longer posing hours for live models. But before expulsion, he exhibited several works at Brera's annual Salone in 1882. And you should know that the Salon was the only place in Milan, it was the only official exhibition place, so he probably signed up for the Academy not to study art, but to be able to exhibit in its show. At the exhibition, Rosso showed three well-modeled heads, and two of them are showing you right now. Um, they were in bronzed terracotta, and um, one is called Azonzo, wandering around, and the other one is called Dopo una scappata, after a prank. You can see his rebellious mindset already. These were very popular streetwise adolescent types. Today I want to show you um, the third one, which is never discussed in the literature, which is called In Exploration, In Esplorazione, and it shows a Garibaldian soldier in a uniform. In Esplorazione refers explicitly to these national issues that I've been trying to trace for you. Um, it was later titled at various stages, Avanguardia, Bersagliere, um, and posthumously, Garibaldino. The work's multiple titles identify the subject, if any of you have any military knowledge, as a, um, as a, as a soldier in the Risorgimento. In Esplorazione, Avanguardia, and Bersagliere, all refer specifically to sharpshooters. Uh, these were special soldiers set out in front of the troops as lookouts, and they operated at very close range. Rosso's Garibaldian sharpshooter, however, is uh, not very bellicose. It contrasts sharply with the typical heroic portraits of Bersaglieri during this period, such as those seen in paintings like this by Silvestro Lega, which represent the figures in very active heroic poses. Rosso's marksman, on the other hand, wears a kind of a blank, unreadable expression that might be interpreted as glum or quietly alert, but certainly doesn't depict any warrior-like qualities such as anger or determination or readiness for action. It does not, therefore, convey the standard mythology of heroism that still prevailed when such Garibaldian subjects were represented. The figure's lack of military conviction is evident, finally, in the fact that the Bersaglieri usually wore black metal helmets adorned with feathers. Rosso's marksman, however, wears a fez hat with a pom-pom that the Bersaglieri sometimes wore at the military base, but never in battle because it would have been considered unsafe. And if anybody is a wild expert on 19th century Italian painting and would like to point to the only exception by Michele Camerana, just um, Note that it's quite obvious that that fez was added for dramatic effect and to add some color, but it's clearly not a true image of, I mean, in their, nobody in their right mind would go out into battle with the fez rather than the um, special hat that they have. Rosso's later choice of title, Avanguardia, might even be related in a completely non-military vein as a witty double entendre by which he alluded to avant-garde art, avant-guardia, the term being used to describe the most innovative and foreign-looking artistic achievements of the time. So what I wanted to show you here is that Rosso's in, in Esplorazione epitomizes the problems of making modern sculpture during this very troubled period in Italy. It registers a no man's land, neither fully committed to upholding the glorious memories of the Risorgimento's battles, nor able to imagine any new kind of heroism to replace it. His attempt to find a way out of this no man's land becomes the catalyst that would soon lead Rosso to design his revolutionary, completely unheroic monuments to one of the Risorgimento's greatest champions, Giuseppe Garibaldi, to which we'll now turn. So a little history. The death of Garibaldi, Italy's most charismatic father figure on June 2nd, 1882, marks a watershed moment in Italy. His passing left many citizens feeling orphaned and anxious. It reinforced feelings of abandonment and betrayal in the many Italians who had grown dissatisfied with the choices made by the new state and the unfulfilled promises of Garibaldi to realize a democratic polity. Members of Rosso's generation experienced this disappointment most acutely. The creation of a politically unambiguous image of Garibaldi became vital to the mourning process, as suggested by the unprecedented wave of competitions for monuments that swept the country and went on until the century's end. 
In the face of uncertainty about Italy's future, the government attempted to bolster the myth of national strength by encouraging the building of monuments with recognizable heroic iconography. The traditional way in which all aspiring sculptors of the 19th century established their careers and reputations took place through the creations of monuments to national heroes. So Garibaldi's death obviously provided Rosso with his first chance to make just such a monument. In October 1882, two months after the Salona, still a student at Brera, he submitted his project for one of the first tributes to Garibaldi in Pavia. He chose to depict Garibaldi as a thinker, titling his project Il Genio dell'Umanità, the genius of humanity. And of course, I have no images to show you because this project probably ended up in the trash can. But I do have a description. As the committee described it, um, everybody, English is better than Italian. I put the Italian up, but I can do both, actually. Um, Rosso's work represents, or to put it better, should represent, Garibaldi on a rock at the bank of an ocean, crouched in the act of concentration, with a strongly pensive expression, meditating on one of his courageous enterprises, the genius of humanity, freeing itself on flight on the top of the hero, makes a star shine over his head. So it's rappresento a dir meglio, dovrebbe rappresentare Garibaldi su uno scoglio in riva al mare, in atto di raccoglimento, con espressione fortemente pensosa, meditante alcuna ardita sua impresa. Il genio dell'umanità, librandosi a volo sull'eroe, fa brillare sul capo di lui una stella. There are some wild projects. I mean, this is the most wild, but when you actually look at the ones that were rejected, there's some really crazy things. While the members of the commission recognized Rosso's design as the most innovative of the 16 proposals, they lamented that, quote, the person of the general does not act strongly pensive, but rather seems gloomy, glaring, and oppressed. La persona del generale non si atteggia fortemente pensosa, ma piuttosto cupo, truce, e oppressa. The work was likely rejected because it didn't conform to what was soon to become the typical physique for sculptures of Garibaldi. These are earlier images, but they continued in the sculptures. A virile, athletic-looking man, the very image of the heroic warrior. A Garibaldi seated in melancholic reflection was certainly not a hero the commission could embrace. The winner of that competition was the Milanese sculptor Egidio Pozzi, whose monument in Piazza Castello in Pavia reflects all the right criteria. Because Rosso's revolutionary unheroic monument ran counter to Italy's nation building program, it has received little mention, both in studies of Garibaldi and in his commemoration. This lacuna is very surprising, for historians and art historians regret the homogeneity of the existing monuments to Garibaldi as the hero of the two worlds, as he was known because of his campaign in South America and Europe, in which he was typical, typically representing posing valiantly, either standing or on horseback. Scholars note that the conformity of the Garibaldi monuments represents a cultural scenario that was constructed to support an increasingly inflexible political position during a process of national self-legitimization. While this interpretation is undoubtedly at least partially true, what scholars also ignore is that there was an enormous climate of intolerance for an avant-garde sculpture such as Rosso. If you think compared to Paris, I don't know how many of you have experience with French art, but the Salon de Refusé in Paris in the 1860s already had a space for artists whose works were not considered uh, okay for the official um, for the establishment, and out of the Salon de Refusé is what impression, how Impressionism was born. There was no such thing in Italy until the 1890s. Surprisingly, Rosso scholars have conducted no research concerning the two Garibaldi commissions, and this is probably due to Rosso's own statements later in his life in which he was completely opposed to any kind of monumental sculpture. It's easy to see why Rosso's project was deemed so problematic in its time. Il Genio dell'Umanità was a mature, meditative, seated thinker shown with a classical winged genius flying over his head. Members of the jury sought an image of a powerful, charismatic leader, not a contemplative one. Commissions and judges controlled the iconography and ensured that official images of Garibaldi promoted this unambiguous political vision. Uh, as historians Lucy Ryle and Ilaria Porciani argue, the government sought to reestablish authority during a period of national crisis, and it appropriated the virile icon of Garibaldi to consolidate the idea of a strong nation. So why might Rosso have opted for, uh, against imagining Garibaldi as a man of action in 1882? We've already said that he had no actual memory of this image. The small Garibaldian soldier that he presents in Brera in 1882 reflects his diminished, confused idea of risorgimento heroism. 
but that's only a partial explanation. His pensive Garibaldi denotes the artist's own sense of disorientation in the post-Risorgimento period. His less stereotypical Garibaldi might also have been intended to recognize those who, who, like Rosso himself, saw the current political situation in a non-heroic light, outside the moments of action in battle. Instead, he emphasized Garibaldi's wisdom and calm, as well as his love of the sea, his willful exile to the island of Caprera. Indeed, Rosso's was perhaps the most realistic vision of Garibaldi at the end of his life. The artistic language upon which Rosso drew also reflects his engagement with a long history of ideas in sculpture about how to represent the physicality of a sitting rather than a standing figure, while providing the viewer with evidence of a rich inner life. This is just a very quick rush through art history, but since antiquity, the seated pose in sculpture was always reserved for, seat, for uh, thinkers, for great thinkers, not men of action. Uh, there was a major shift during the Renaissance, which since you are in Florence, you should all know this. The figure's mental, spiritual, and emotional stato d'animo, or state of mind, gave form to the sculptural body in a play of contrast between the seated position and the person's charismatic force. This contrast was established by Michelangelo in his figure of Moses in the Church of San Pietro in Vincoli in Rome in 1513-1515, and in his tombs for the Medici uh, in the San Lorenzo Chapel in Florence, 1520-1559. Moving closer to Rosso's time, the Swiss-Italian sculptor Vincenzo Vela made a very daring sculpture entitled The Last Days of Napoleon in 1866. It was exhibited in Paris and too wildly popular in France, and so it was sold to the French state for Versailles, where you can still see it today. Vela's was the first sculpture to represent the French emperor in a non-victorious pose here. The sitting position expressed discouragement, melancholy, physical decay, and imminent demise. But Vela's Napoleon did not attempt to convey an image of inner strength. In imagining a physically vigorous yet seated protagonist, Rosso was also engaging with the most important contemporary French debates about monumental sculpture. The seated figure had been the central focus of artistic discussions in France since the 30s, so it was a long absorbed discussion already in France. And one of the important examples, if you go to the Musée d'Orsay during your travels, um, it was Jean-Baptiste Carpeau's Ugolino and His Sons of 1865-67, which kind of became a model for 19th century sculptors who were trying to represent a Michelangelo-like tension between seatedness and lack of emotional repose. If any of you have read Dante, he's meditating whether he should eat his children or not. Strong bodies now became vehicles for expressing their subjects' existential dilemmas. But only with Rodin's The Thinker, which I'm sure you've all seen, of 1880, did European sculptors resolve the problem of how to represent this tension, anticipating the fixation of the modern era on the existential anguish of the individual. Now, given the very, very great closeness of the dates, it's impossible not to think of Rodin's thinker from his gates of hell when you read the commission's description of Rosso's first Garibaldi monument as showing a man, quote, crouched in an act of concentration with a strongly pensive expression. Now, this resemblance might simply be a coincidence about two very innovative artists um, of the time, but on the other hand, it is quite possible that by 1882, Rosso had seen or read something about the gates of hell, begun two years earlier, and he may have been one of the first people in Italy to recognize its importance for the history of modern sculpture, thereby transposing it into an idea of Garibaldi. Um, scholars actually believe that the thinker was not known until much later, 1888, but there has been a lot of new research that indicates otherwise because many artists visited Rodin's studio and um, wrote back home describing this strange work called Dante that matches the description of the thinker at the top of the gate of hell. It's of hell because it was called Dante originally. Rosso also might have seen a reproduction of the little clay Dante, uh, such as was in this little studio photograph, um, dated 1881, but we just don't have a history of how these photographs travel. Did people just stick them in their suitcase and bring them home? We don't know, but the photographs were circulating. Um, international collectors in 1881 were already contracting with Rodin to buy them, and one was sold to a Greek stockbroker and collector uh, by the name The Thinker. There were also visual and verbal descriptions in England and in Paris in journals that we know circulated in Italy. Ultimately, whatever the source for Rosso, his little bozzetto of the Garibaldi for Pavia is extraordinary and original due to its accurate reflection of the post-Risorgimento situation in Italy. Critics were right to see it as a poorly resolved attempt to tie the seed of meditative old man to the new national spirit that was attempting to take flight. One unnamed critic wrote in the report to the commission, 
the figure of the genius released in the air does not compose itself harmoniously in a natural and evident connection with the figure of the hero, but rather the two figures seem disjointed from one another. La figura del genio librato dell'aria non si compone in bella armonia di un nesso naturale ed evidente con la figura dell'eroe, ma stanno le due figure l'una dall'altra disgiunte. And I think that word is really important. This discomfort and disjunction symbolizes the painful condition of the moment. In the monument, Rosso was trying to link the past, in this case, the lived experience of Garibaldi, with the dynamic forces shaping the future. Uh, Italianist Enzo del Tedesco has described this disincanto or disillusionment in a chapter on Ottocento literature called The Old and the Young, The Century Comes to a Close. I vecchi e i giovani secolo volge al termine. She describes the exhaustion of the risorgimento myth in Italian literature of the period and the, quote, impossibility to share in the present and transmit to the future a common ideal. More recently, psychologist James Hillman has described such a phenomenon in broader terms. Images of disjunction, uh, this is the only image I could find, appear at historical moments when there seems to be no obvious or meaningful connection between generations. Old and new are expressed as the polarity between the senex, the old man, characterized as Saturnine, static, and melancholy, and his opposite, the puer, the little boy, the dynamic winged figure. Rosso's vision of Garibaldi can be understood as the expression of an entire generation struggling to adapt in a difficult period of transition. As Irish poet W.B. Yeats wrote in 1919, in any historical epoch of disunity, quote, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, anarchy and violence explode, and quote, the center cannot hold. The design for the Pavia monument was the first, oops, not yet, was the first rejection Rosso experienced. But instead of being discouraged, it became his banner. He used it as an opportunity to express dissent. Undeterred by his rejection in September 1884, he defiantly submitted a second Garibaldi monument to the competition in Milan, radically rephrasing the sculptural language he had used to prevent, present the first Garibaldi monument in Pavia. Its title, hitherto unknown, is recorded in the original documents as Gratitude, Excitement, Promise. And there's that word, promise for the future. Riconoscenza, citazione, promessa. The disjunction between past and present, one that Rosso had alluded to in the first design of 1882, now became very obvious and very extreme. And again, I don't have an image, I only have a description, but I think it will render the idea. The rejection of Rosso's final design for a monument to Garibaldi, his most anti-heroic and modern statement up to that point, demonstrates how rigid the Italian political climate had become since his first efforts only two years before. It also shows how the iconography of the leader had fossilized into these standardized types. In a gesture of extreme protest, Rosso simply eliminated the figure of Garibaldi from the very monument intended to glorify him. Rosso's radical act, the making of a monument without a hero, prefigured the demise of the traditional style of the figural monument and anticipated a completely new language for modern sculpture. The only description of the work comes from the progressive left-wing daily newspaper La Lombardia, and it says, a group of demonstrators that comes to blow with the public security guards and with the police, and flag bearers climbing up the lamppost and waving a banner. All around are people who squabble and roll around on the ground. Un gruppo di dimostranti viene alle mani con le guardie di PS e coi carabinieri. Un portabandiera si arrampica su di un fanale, agita un vesillo. Tutto all'ingiro della gente che si accapiglia e che ruzzola per terra. One critic, on seeing the new work, missing a hero, and dominated by an unruly mob of demonstrators, described it as a, quote, battle cry and an open clash between two forces. The project could not even be understood by enlightened Italian critics. As one critic, Mario Mariani, recalled, it was strange, bizarre, so audacious as to be absurd. Era strano, bizzarro, audacissimo all'assurdo. Today, we can see that the modernity of Rosso's monument, although not evident at the time, lies in its complete rejection of the tradition of heroic myth-making and sculpture. In his written statement, Rosso declared that it is time to put an end to conventionalisms. And Mariani wrote in an interview with Rosso, Rosso told us with his frank and faithful soul of a young and vigorous man, but what colonnades, but what staircases, but what porticos for the hero of an entire glorious epoch, Garibaldi reduced to the proportions, to the attitudes of an ordinary Don Quixote, awkward and elegant, or elegant like a little medieval puppet, 
It would be too grave an insult to permit this. The ardent vote of his last days was a free Italy, but entirely free. Here is the monument that is truly worthy of him. But what marbles, but what statues, but what horses and capes and bas-reliefs. This was not how the project was received, however. Even the few sympathetic critics who praised the work's originality nonetheless felt that Rosso had ended up, quote, in the arms of the most strange exaggerations that the artist's mind knows how to imagine. Rosso would later recall very proudly that even his friend Felice Cameroni, the journalist who had frequently championed him, on this occasion called him mattoide, nutty. After four rounds of the competition, in which no project was chosen, a proposal by the sculptor Hector Jimenez was accepted in 1889. His statue, erected in 1894, restored the subject's traditional status with the heroic Garibaldi shown on horseback. Ooh. The statue still stands today in Largo Cairoli in Milan, in case you come visit. Let's look more closely at Rosso's second rejection. His second design for a Garibaldi monument suggested division rather than unity. The clash between the demonstrators and the guards does not seem to relate to a specific historical event whose meaning could be shared by all. It might refer to the divisions that emerged during and after unification between military hierarchies and the spontaneous groupings that followed Garibaldi, or as well as between liberal conservatives and Democrats, governing bodies and the people, patriots and foreigners. But whatever the conflict was about, it was neither contained or resolved by the reassuring and lofty presence of an iconic hero. With this monument, therefore, Rosso made a clear statement not only about his own personal disorientation, as he had suggested with the meditative Garibaldi in his first design, he now conveyed in a single powerful image the disorientation of his entire generation. It was nothing less than a decisive rejection of the nation-building mythology that had been constructed and used so ably by the government to glorify Garibaldi and promote a sense of national unity among widely different social classes. In creating a horizontal image of strife, remember the description, Rosso launched his fiercest challenge to monumental sculpture by abolishing the heroic notion of verticality. According to literary historian Stamos Mitsitsakis, the vertical line represented by the column in sculpture from ancient times all the way through the 19th century functioned semiotically as a kind of degree zero or ultimate restrictive element for movement in sculpture as well as the viewer's body. When you stand in front of the sculpture, you also have to stand vertically like the sculpture. Metzidakis argues that in the second half of the century, French poets like Théophile Gautier and Charles Baudelaire began to emphasize what the author called the boredom of the straight line, la nuit de la ligne droite, which signalized the agonized state of neoclassicism and began to presage the beginning of modern sculpture. The vertical sculpture becomes even more retrograde, heralding the approach of the horizontal axis in the form of variable and sinuous lines, and this would reflect a kind of more modern romantic character. So by eliminating the figure of the hero in the second Garibaldi monument, Rosso negated its central point, rupturing the long-standing semiotic function of verticality. I should mention, but I can't discuss in depth here, more in the book, that in the same year, Rosso had made a completely astonishing horizontal funerary monument called La Riconoscenza, Gratitude, depicting a woman mourning or trying to crawl into a deep hole cut directly into the ground. The work was immediately removed from the cemetery due, uh, due to protests over perceived indecency. Also because her legs were shown and her shoes were off and she was not in decorous position. Although Rosso's studies always considered this work a lapse into conventional kind of verista work, its horizontality, which is rarely discussed, is right in line with the most radical innovative sculptures in France, such as um, this private experiment by Degas called Le Tub, which was a little tub and a woman in it with actually real water in it. And you can see that he's completely broken the idea of the vertical sculpture because you have to look down from the top while you're standing there to see it. Another very radical work right at the same time was Rodin's The Burgers of Calais, very uh, 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 revolutionary because it was considered to be horizontal, no pedestal, uh, no hero, only the emotional anguish of the figures in it. Now note that the central hole of the area in Rosso is an actual hole in the ground, which is completely unusual, and it's even blasphemous for showing an open grave in a, in a Christian cemetery, um, because it doesn't show the, the closure of the passage between this world and the next one. But just keep this cut in mind, because I'm going to show you a contemporary monument that's going to speak back to this. In the second Garibaldi statue, Rosso also rejected the image of Garibaldi as the unifying father of the patria, 
understood in the hollow and forced terms being presented during his time. The total absence of Garibaldi in Rosso's design also made a, gener uh, a statement about absent fathers, such as those who had died in the war and those whose stories of patriotism alienated from their sons, uh, them from their sons who had not shared in their experience. And you can see these little children in many of these paintings. There's no father, but there's the father figure of Garibaldi as a kind of substitute. He thus exposed what historian Susan Stewart Seinberg sees as the defining crisis of post risorgimento Italy. One represented, of course, by the popular fatherless uh, figure of Pinocchio in La Ventura di Pinocchio, exactly in the same year, 1883, by Carlo Colloni. This national psychological crisis was masked by the official public image of Garibaldi as a good hero father, one effectively standing in for fathers who were literally absent or who could not create a dialogue with their children. Psychologist Luigi Zoya analyzed the evolution of the father figure, especially in Italy, and he finds parallels in the relationship between the feelings of a public leader uh, evoked in a country's citizen and those that a father in the same country and at the same time awakens in his sons. What we most tend to lack, Zoya says, is precisely this positive authority within us, within the psyche, and we combat this void by demanding that it come from somewhere else in the outside world, and demand, when directed to the outside world, generates supply. And perhaps this resonates with the grand appeal of Donald Trump today. Rosso's project dramatically exposes the fact that official attempts to create a sense of paternal authority and protection through standardized public monuments that cast Garibaldi in the role of father of the nation had failed. The work demonstrates that such schemes neglected the needs of the new, young, future generation. What was missing was a father figure who promoted what Zoya had called the development of the next generation's human potential. Ultimately, Rosa's horizontal monument design without a traditional vertical access represents a sense of conflict rather than harmony, unity, or resolution. Obviously, everybody had his, own, his or own vision of Garibaldi, who would continue to be appropriated by the left as well as the right as well as the fascist for decades to come. In Rosso's time, his friend, the French uh, symbolist Camille Saint-Croix, was one of the only writers to call the Garibaldi statue a counter-project, for it really did prefigure the dismantling of traditional idioms of monumental art. The only scholar to have noted the importance of this uh, project, Giovanna Ginex, called it an extraordinary indirect monument that overturns the pedantic logic of monumental sculpture, base plus statue plus isolated decoration, finally offering a plastic solution that is iconographically original and of European breadth. Rosso's innovatives anticipated the gradual erosion of the genre and its cultural and political function. And all we need to think is Giorgio de Chirico, who would later express this crisis so literally in such paintings as Piazza d'Italia of 1915, in which classical monuments are shown abandoned in deserted city squares. In the end, Rosso's works of the early 1880s raised the question of whether or not it is possible to create a successful monument not centered on a heroic figure. And an answer might only come from our time in Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial in Washington. In 1982, Lin, then an unknown 21-year-old 21, 21 Chinese-American student, also born too late, won the competition for the monument. The resulting horizontally oriented monument was a V-shaped wall composed of a series of black reflected stones into the earth with the names of those killed in action engraved in chronological order. To search out a loved one, a mourner must walk along the monument and find the name among the 57,661 listed. Consonant with Lin's idea of the monument as a, quote, gash in the earth, not unlike Rosso's open hole in La Riconoscenza, the lowest part of the V cuts into the ground like a painful wound in flesh. However, the composition also foresees the ground suturing and scarring by nature and the surrounding environment, as author Malcolm Miles has noted. Like Rosso's Garibaldi monument, Lynn's memorial avoids the idealizing language of allegory and the replication of social hierarchies to heal social wounds. The viewer's experience of the monument as he or she walks along the wall is highly physical, unfolding horizontally, but also down into the earth and back up at each end of the structure. The viewer, walking and then stopping to look at individual names, experiences both motion and stillness, and as Miles suggests, both openness and closure. Lynn's tribute is at once of the moment and of eternity, creating a specific encounter with um, the name of the deceased soldiers and evoking a general reflection on death and the nature of mourning. As she recalls, quote, I thought what death is, what loss is, a sharp pain that lessens with time but can never quite heal over, 
a scar. Ultimately, Lynn's memorial is a commemoration of specific individuals, heroes, and ordinary, ordinary soldiers alike, rather than a depiction of impersonal myths of fatherland and heroism. Overturning the traditional concept of the highest point of the focus of a monument, the center of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is its lowest and deepest point, precisely where it cuts most deeply into the ground. But the descent into the trench or casket of the past and the reality of war also precedes the viewer's inevitable rise from its central point, suggesting catharsis and hope for the future. Medardo Rosso had intuited this idea of creating a monument that successfully avoids a central and univocal hero figure 100 years earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is uh, wonderful. And uh, I took the students of modern Italy class. It fits perfectly. Oh, okay. So thank you very much. Um, we did something on monuments. We did something on memorial. So well, uh, thank you very much. Um, in that light, I'd like to ask um, uh, some question, which uh, I'm, not, I'm not an art historian. And you, your frame is clearly uh, that I um, formal, so mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not able to engage properly with that. But from an historical uh, perspective, the first question which you love out from Italians, I'm sure, is politics. The genius of humanity, yeah. not to say the second one, which is even more obviously, I mean, it clearly goes beyond the nation. Yes, absolutely. So, What's Medardo Rosso politics and is the rejection, besides being a formal one, is a political one, would seem pretty, pretty likely thing to explore yes. because humanity, it's not in the 1880s something that you say like this. It's yes. not humanity abstract, it's humanity, Victor uh, Hugo to say the least. So that's, that's the first. Questions. So, what's the what what's the politics? politics of all of that? So, Rosso's politics, which is a very big subject of my book, because he actually gets more and more and more resistant to this Italy, and he leaves Italy in 1889, making a very strong statement about the failure. He also, I think, is in touch with some very internationalist people, like Ernesto Teodoro Moneta, and people who are really proposing humanity. Those, that language of, I mean, Moneta is sadly not studied, but he was the Italian winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in the early 1900s, and he dreamed up this crazy idea of a united Europe and a, say, a coin that, you know, money that would be all, you know, everything that we have now, basically, he thought of in a nutshell. Um, and Rosso is very attuned to that because he joins the Freemasons, which is another group that is all about universal brotherhood. When he goes to Paris, he proclaims himself as a man without borders, a citizen of the world. He um, says he makes art without limits. So yes, this humanity issue, he wants to make art that doesn't look too Italian, that doesn't look too French. Um, it's a real interesting case, which is the subject of my book, about this, this artist who becomes a complete cosmopolitan. And he gets French citizenship, but then he comes back to Italy. I mean, he's really, and he, all of his work is based on this idea of these human emotions that can be shared by everybody. So his politics are very alive here. Um, I think his connections with a lot of the journalists of the time is very interesting, more than artists of the time. I think he's being fed many political ideas of the moment that will lead to this kind of international viewpoint. Thank you for the talk. I was wondering about those 400 monuments you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, are they distributed equally across the country, or is there, I don't know, decline as you go further south, which I would uh, expect, you know, considering... Uh, how... he, he was very beloved in the south, too, so okay. I, think, I, I think it's pretty uniform all over Italy. I mean, the one we found for the poster was in Cesenatico, <laughs> of all places. Okay. Lord Garibaldi, she told me today, Claudia told me, was there for two days because Anita was sick, and that is still celebrated once a year, right? Mm -hmm. Is that... As a, so it was a, it was a real uh, national um, epidemic phenomenon. Okay, so there aren't any major cities where there's an exception, where they didn't have a monument put up, or? I don't know, Ask uh, Italians should know this, but I mean, it's hard to think. I mean, tiny towns, everywhere you go, there's the monument to Garibaldi. <laughs> now you guys will start noticing them as you 
go around. Um, just an observation because I, I'm particularly attached to the Maya Lin uh, monument. And it, for me, it was I, I didn't know the uh, Medardo uh, woman lying down yeah. into the grave, which is such a striking and completely modern image. But when I got the Locandina for your talk, um, and I was thinking about you know verticality and monumentality and how so often it's a um, celebration of success. So, you know, Garibaldi as the father of the country and so on. And yet in today's art, almost all monuments are monuments in some way to failure, like um, Maya Lin's monument, which was supposed to celebrate soldiers, and yet we call it the Veterans Memorial. So in some way, it's more about the survivors and the devastation that remains. And it reminded me of the very few monuments that we build nowadays that, that are often to Holocaust or right. memorials. Berlin is a perfect example. Berlin, Vienna, um, Solowitz Black Form in Hamburg and so on. So it's almost in a hundred years how um, our whole sense of uh, celebration and belonging to certain patterns of behavior and belief have just completely changed. And I think that's more in the contemporary art that we're seeing yeah, today. I mean, these descriptions sound perfect for contemporary art, they must have sounded completely wild and out of place in the 19th century where they were the monumentomania. That, I mean, if you go to France, that's the land of, of monuments to heroes still in the 19th century. But then they, they begin to just peter out and lose their, their strength. And one thing about that funerary monument I showed, actually there's a book, uh, Jack Burnham, who wrote a book about sculpture, he but he puts it in his book, which is the first time anybody actually put that strange sculpture, which was thrown away after, again, after it was uh, eliminated from the cemetery. And he says it's, it's a really early example of minimalist art and land art and, you know, all kinds of things. You know, just the idea of having to walk around something flat on the floor. I mean, nobody was doing that at the time. Um, and in fact, it was considered too blasphemous to remain in the cemetery. So, um, in terms of the, the concept of generation that you are exploring, that's a very useful one, mm -hmm. and certainly is among the uh, born too late. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, is uh, is born too early to be born a little bit too late. If we if we think about that's exactly, true. because in a way you are. I was a little puzzled by the fact that you are sort of pushing him like he was. Uh, a man uh, of the uh, uh, and, uh, of, of already a nation which is organized, but in the early 60s, when he is in elementary school, things are very messy yeah. and still not organized. So uh, by using Kore and using Vamba, I felt like you are pushing Push like again. his formation a little bit too as, as the nation is already done. Mm -mm -mm. Um, and that is a little bit sort of not completely, uh, kind of not completely right. Uh, this is just mm -hmm. a kind of a, a response that I have. So the, the messy first years in which things get set up, and then there is 1870, and then. So it's a, it's a generation which I would stress that mess rather than being already a sort of generation born in 15 years later, which mm -hmm. is a little bit more kind of the picture you are portraying at the beginning, but this is very technical. That's I think it's historical. because there isn't really a, a good writing that captures it until later. You know, they're looking back retrospectively, but it's, I couldn't really find anything that expressed his generation in the 60s and 70s. I'm trying to think even now what, how, but you know, he has a very interesting story. Also, I didn't, I couldn't tell you guys because it would have gotten too long. But yeah, I think the Vamba was based on because finally that generation has gotten a name. You know, these Nati Troppo Tardi that they are not neither here nor there. Just like you said, he's also too early. But also, I didn't say that his father was a, a train. Um, he was a he was a, a, a train controller, and those were the most politicized people of Italy. And his father really, I'm sure, that influenced his political views too, because that's when the whole government falls because of the train <coughs> privatization, and there's unions, and there's and his father is certainly influencing that. He's not coming out of a family of craftsmen. He's coming out of a up lower bourgeois family of very politically involved families. And this moving around from Turin to Milan is also because his father is getting moved to different positions. So, yeah, I didn't have time to get into that because I thought it might be too specific for you guys. Thank you so much. Oh,
Thank you all for coming. <laughs>